Oh, there we go. Yeah, see? <laughs> I knew there was something I had to press. Anyway, so before I start, I'd just like to say that I'm really glad to be here, um, surrounded by so many amazing activists and academics and revolutionaries even. I've never had an opportunity to attend one of these conferences before, although I've read all of the previous conference booklets with great interest, and it was those booklets that actually inspired me to do the research that brought me here today. And it deals with topics of archaeology, culture, the institutions that we create to preserve them, and how they can become perverted by nationalism and the state. Archaeology as a discipline has a checkered past, from its roots in colonialism to its misappropriation by the fascist dictatorships of the 25th century, the paradigmatic shifts are relatively well studied. But this history still weighs very heavy on the actual heritage policies decided upon by governments. Like Abdullah Öcalan's critique of the social sciences as tools of power, we can apply this critique to archaeology in particular and ask ourselves, how do we practice an archaeology of freedom? That is to say, an archaeology without the trappings of nationalism, statism, and patriarchal biases. Advances have been made in decolonial and anarchist archaeological theory, similar in many ways to Murray Bookchin and Abdullah Öcalan's perspectives. But the practical applications of a non-hierarchical outlook remain understudied. So how do we instill these values in the cultural and heritage institutions that we create? Well we can catch a glimpse of what this democratic community ownership of heritage can look like without the intervention of the state by looking at the case study of archaeological committees in the autonomous administration of northeast Syria. But before we get into practicalities, first we must pay some attention as to why archaeology is such a potent tool for both liberation and domination. The practice of creating a mythical lineage for a state's rulers and institutions is about as old as states themselves. When we look at ancient historical records and documents, the overwhelming majority of preserved works present us with a rather one-sided picture. The histories of royal succession, court dramas, and imperial conquests are well documented and often expressly written as propaganda. The histories of commoners, on the other hand, not so much. And problematically, this bias continues to exist within archaeology, driven by the discipline's close proximity to the nation state. In fact, the focus on state civilization is ingrained in the very language we use to describe the ebb and flow of empires. In David Graeber and David Wengrow's book, The Dawn of Everything, they pay particular attention to this linguistic bias. One of the example of this is the term pre-dynastic Uruk. Uruk being the most famous of the Mesopotamian early cities. And this term, pre-dynastic Uruk, is a term that is used to denote around 700 years of alternative communal political organization. But still, it's denoted as pre-dynastic. Why not describe it on its own merits? What this demonstrates is that the state-based civilization is still taken as the default, the desired form of social organization. And alternatives are seen as either anomalies or underdeveloped and still on the trajectory towards the state. Just as much as ancient empires created extensive state-based mythologies, modern nation states practice a very similar historical theater. And archaeology is often employed as a method to give such national epics a degree of scientific legitimation, cementing claims to both territory and power. One could write such an analysis of an almost every single nation state on the planet today. In Syria's case, being a post-colonial state with borders drawn up by imperial powers of Europe, it had to invent its own national canon. The Syrian state's new Arab-centric history would thus become a melding of various cultures and preceding states. For example, Queen Zenobia of the Palmyrene Empire was to become a progenitor of the Syrian Arab identity. And the ruins of Palmyra itself became a central piece of national iconography. More so than just deifying the nation state and its rulers, providing them with a mythic heritage, the state-based approach is also instrumental in excising history of oppressed peoples, be it commoners, 
ethnic minorities, or women. And states often have a vested interest in erasing these histories, as Cremity archaeologist Paulette Steves highlights in relation to indigenous people in the Americas. She decries the simplification of indigenous people in the Americas as one pan-hemispheric cultural group, that is to say, encompassing the entirety of the Americas, and we are referred to as the Clovis people, thought up until recently to be the first people to reach the Americas. But this term is long outdated, albeit still commonly used. This relates to another important question, that of the settlement timeline of the Americas. And this has become a deeply political question for indigenous people, albeit not by their choice. For centuries, early American anthropologists and subsequently archeologists vehemently denied the possibility of settlement of the Americas prior to 13,000 BCE, which in turn effectively denied indigenous claims to the land established in oral traditions. After all, in the minds of the colonists, how could their claim be any more legitimate than that of the Europeans if they had only been there a mere few thousand years? And whilst the re-examination and discovery of more and more pre-Clovis sites has been breaking down the Clovis first theory and pushing back the date of arrival in the Americas, it remains a debate fraught with controversy. For Kurdistan especially, there was an immense effort by state-sponsored Turkish academia to erase its historical and cultural identity. One of the archaeologists I interviewed during my research, Salah Aldin Sino from Afrin, emphasized that this is part of Turkey's occupation. Heritage sites in the occupied areas are targeted by mercenary and jihadist groups, sites such as Aindara, Sirus, and its numerous tells. They've been repeatedly looted with artifacts being smuggled out of the region and Kurdish and Yazidi heritage being purposefully destroyed. This targeted erasure can be seen as yet another component of the Turkish state's war against the Kurdish identity. So how do we respond to this systematized historical and cultural erasure? Well, one approach to this is history from below but let's define it before we continue any further. Marcus Redeker, a historian of Atlantic seafaring and author of an excellent book on pirates, by the way, provides a concise list of criteria. One, working people are its subject. And two, it always treats questions of power and oppression and resistance as they are joined historically. Three, it talks about the experience of ordinary people. Four, it talks about the consciousness of ordinary people. Five, it tries to recover the voices of ordinary people. And finally, six, it is about the agency of working people. Judging by Redeker's criteria, we can say that the historical narratives put forth by Murray Bookchin and Abdullah Öcalan fall squarely into this category. Both Bookchin and Öcalan examine the same historical undercurrent, that of resistance and rebellion against hierarchies, labeling it as the legacy of freedom and democratic civilization, respectively. And it shouldn't be understated how central this is to their political projects, being able to identify alternatives to the hegemonic state civilization in the past also allows us to imagine liberatory alternatives in the present and future it becomes a fundamental part of breaking with the suffocating fog of capitalist realism. By moving our focus from the history of rulers to that of rebels, we offer ordinary people, quote unquote, especially those from marginalized communities, a chance to reconnect with a past that many feel was never about them. What children and students are taught today is essentially a hagiography of their nation state one built on the toil and suffering of their ancestors. It then becomes unsurprising that many take little interest in a history where they would have had no agency, which can inspire a correspondingly drab view of the future. According to pan-African social ecologist Modibo Kadali, uncovering these lost histories of past resistance can function as a locus for communities to reconnect with local heritage 
and through community-led archaeology, emphasis on lead, they can assert, quote, their community's place in history and its contribution to the human tradition of intimate direct democracy. This brings us to the example set by the autonomous heritage institutions that were set up following the start of the Syrian civil war and the proclamation of democratic autonomy in the Northeast. Having had the opportunity to interview several of the co-chairs of these committees, I'd like to tell you a bit more about how this process unfolded. In cities such as Afrin, Kobane, and others, part of the first autonomous cantons of the burgeoning Democratic Confederation, founding the Antiquities Committees was undertaken shortly after the proclamation of democratic autonomy. Initially, activities were limited to public outreach efforts in schools and neighborhoods, restoration work, and the monitoring of archaeological sites. Meanwhile, in Raqqa, Mandij, and other Arab-majority cities that were liberated from Islamic State at a later date, the destruction and looting of antiquities became so commonplace that it was quite literally turned into an institutionalized industry by IS's Divan al rikaz the so-called Ministry of Precious Resources. We're all likely familiar with the iconoclastic destruction of prominent landmarks, statues, and mosaics perceived as idolatry. But the sale of artifacts would also become a major motivating factor for jihadists and poverty-stricken locals alike. Following the liberation of these cities by the Syrian Democratic Forces, the true toll of this would become known. Thousands of artifacts were missing from museums, and sites throughout the cities and countryside were damaged. The efforts to rebuild these museums and the region's national heritage also began shortly after their liberation. According to Nasiba Mustafa al Khalaf from Raqqa, building positive relations with local communities is a big part of this. For example, monitoring these sites requires close cooperation with locals due to the already immense strain placed upon the internal security services, the Asayish. The Antiquities Committees function in a similar manner to other institutions in the autonomous administration. Each region, Jazira, Tabqa, Deiz Esor, etc., has its own regional committee, which meet together once a month in the overarching Executive Antiquities Council, which consists of the co-chairs of the regional departments along with the co-chairs of the Autonomous Administration's Executive Culture Committee. As with any other institution, each department practices the co-chair system, consisting of locals from each region, and given its decentralized nature, the new system is a clear departure from the heavily centralized and state-controlled heritage institutions of the Assad government. In contrast to the state's focus on creating a unified national identity, the outlook towards heritage in Northeast Syria is that it belongs to all components of society, not a single social or ethnic group. And this approach is very much in line with the region's multicultural history. At the same time, iconography related to the region's past is also beginning to be reappropriated, such as the Zenobia Women's Union adopting the name of the eponymous queen. Decommercializing heritage has become a major focus with strict provisions being created by the Executive Antiquities Council for the preservation and excavation of sites. But according to some of the committee members, the prevailing view of antiquities in the region still largely relates to their monetary value. Combating this mentality is part of why, through outreach initiatives, media, and education, there is a major focus on reconnecting communities and local heritage. And this counts doubly so for the younger generation, having grown up during the conflict. Whilst many people working within the Antiquities Committees attended university for archaeology or other subjects and had, a prior, or had prior experience with excavations, there remains a serious deficit of experts. And until local education institutions and academies can incorporate archaeology into their curricula, this will likely remain the case. This leads to most of the restoration efforts being limited to improving the structural integrity of sites to prevent them from collapsing. Now, there's a lot more I would wish I could talk about here. For example, the role that women play in reclaiming their heritage, 
and in these heritage institutions themselves, but I'll conclude with this. We still have a tremendously long way ahead of us if we are to change the ingrained state-centric mentality and develop a real community-led archaeology. But we can find an example in the practical experiences of Northeast Syria and the theoretical contributions of authors approaching history from below. So it should be considered of paramount importance to bring to the forefront those local histories of resistance and social organization, not just to inform our own praxis, but also to break the nation state's mythos. And this is why I think it would be fitting to adapt Bookchin's famous quote to the context of archeology. span The assumption that what currently exists has always existed is the acid that corrodes all visionary thinking. <laughs>